to welcome you to the second module of this course called Using Locks and Semaphores for the Producer-Consumer Pattern. What are we going to cover in this module? Let us quickly browse through the agenda. Well, this module is about synchronization. Now, we have two ways of synchronizing in the Java language. The synchronized keyword that can be used in several ways and the volatile keyword that we can use on field declarations. Those two keywords are related to what is called intrinsic locking. There is also explicit locking, and this is what we are going to see first, mainly based on the use of the lock interface. Then we will see that using this lock interface and the condition interface, we can implement the wait notify pattern in a different and more powerful way and then we will see what semaphores are. Semaphores are not a new concept in Java. It is a concept that comes from operating system and that is implemented in other languages. We will see the Java flavor of semaphores. Let us introduce intrinsic and explicit locking. If we want to synchronize a method, for instance here, create a key object, which can be whatever object, and to place a synchronized block of code inside this method. This code, synchronized of key, prevents more than one thread to execute the guarded block of code at the same time. This is called the synchronized pattern in Java, and it is well known. Now, what happens if several threads are trying to execute the block of code guarded by the synchronized keyword inside the init method? One of them will be allowed in the block, the others will have to wait for their turn to execute the same block of code. This is the basic synchronization pattern in Java. Now, what would happen if a thread is blocked inside the block of code? And when I mean block, I mean probably wrongly blocked. That is, there is some kind of bug in the init method that will prevent a thread from exiting this guarded block of code. Well, it turns out that all the other threads are also blocked. No other thread will be allowed in this block of code. All the threads waiting to enter this block of code are also blocked. And there is no way in the JDK nor the JVM to release them. So when this kind of situation occurs, most of the time, the only way to solve this problem is to reboot the JVM, that is to shut down the application and to launch it again. Of course, this is something that we want to avoid at all costs. The lock pattern is precisely here to bring a solution to this case. The lock pattern, in fact, brings a richer API to handle exactly this case. Instead of writing this code, that is creating a key object and passing this key object to a synchronized block of code, we are going to write this one. We create an instance of the lock interface. The JDK provides an implementing class which is called reentrant lock. And inside the try finally block of code, we call the lock method of this lock object and in the finally part call the unlock method, thus guaranteeing that this unlock method will be called when exiting this block of code, whatever happens after the lock call. Lock is an interface implemented by a reentrant lock. It is part of the Java Util Concurrent API introduced in Java 5 in 2004. It offers exactly the same guarantees, that is, execution exclusivity and read and write ordering, that is, visibility happens before links between operations as the synchronized pattern. And it also provides more functionalities. Why? Because instead of being a language primitive, which is the case for the synchronized block, it is an API, and on this API, we can have many more methods. Let us now take a closer look at this pattern. On one hand, we have the synchronized pattern. We create instance of any object to use the monitor defined on this object, and this object can be used to guard as many blocks of code as we need. On this lock pattern, we create a lock object instance of the lock interface. And the biggest difference is that on this lock object, we have the methods of the lock interface. And this is through the use of those methods that we will have more patterns and more functionalities for guarding blocks of code and for handling lock acquisition. So what does this lock pattern brings to us? First, it brings interruptible lock acquisition. Let us see that on an example. Here we have the basic pattern with the lock method call that will guard the block of code between the lock and the unlock call. Instead of that, we can call lock interruptibly, which will have the same kind of semantic 
as the log call. That is, the thread calling this method will be blocked until the guarded block of code can be executed. Now, if another thread has a reference on it, it can call the interrupt method on this thread, and the lock interruptibly method, instead of letting it execute the code, will throw itself the interrupted exception, thus releasing the waiting thread. This was not possible with the synchronized pattern. This can be costly, it can be hard to achieve from a pure implementation perspective, but it is possible, it is available as a functionality. The thing we can do is called timed lock acquisition. What does it mean? It means that instead of calling the lock method, we can call the try lock method. And this time, if a thread is already executing the guarded block of code, the try lock called will return false immediately. So instead of being blocked, our thread will not enter the guarded block of code and will be able to do something else immediately. Note that we can also pass a timeout to this try lock method. For example, here, our thread will wait for one second. If the guarded block of code is still not available after this timeout, it will execute the else block of code. And the third functionality we have is called fair lock acquisition. How does it work? Suppose we have several threads waiting for a given lock. Whether it is an intrinsic or explicit lock, the first one to enter the guarded block of code is chosen randomly. This is the default behavior of both the synchronized keyword and the lock object. Fairness means that the first to enter the wait line will also be the first to enter the guarded block of code. Let us see that on an example. By default, a reentrant lock built in the normal way is non-fair, meaning that if two threads are waiting to acquire this lock, we do not know in advance which one is going to execute the guarded block of code first. Now, if we pass the true boolean when building this lock object, this lock object becomes a fair reentrant lock or a fair lock. It means that if two threads are waiting to acquire this lock, the first to enter the guarded block of code will be the first that entered the waitlist. Achieving this is costly, so using fairness is not activated by default, and you should really use that only if you need it absolutely. As we can see, using this lock interface gives our code and our applications some wiggle room. A lock can be interrupted, it's possible, it is hard to achieve, but it has been done, and it is indeed costly in our application. But if we definitely need it, then it is available. The acquisition of this lock object can also be blocked for a certain amount of time. I can ask this lock object and tell, hey, if in one second from now the lock is not available, then I prefer to leave and do something else. And at last, this acquisition can be fair, letting in the threads on a first-come, first-serve basis. And the same goes as for the interruptible lock, it is a costly functionality to activate, so use it only when you definitely need it. Let's see now how we can implement the producer-consumer pattern using this lock interface. The classical way to implement this with the intrinsic locking is probably to use the wait and notify pattern. Wait and notify are methods from the object class that should be called from inside a synchronized block of code. Obviously, since explicit locking does not work with synchronized block of code, the wait notify pattern cannot work at all. So we need another pattern, and this is what we are going to see now. Let us have a quick look on this classical way of implementing this pattern. Here is the code of the producer, and here is the code of the consumer. Those two classes are organized around synchronized block. If the buffer is full, then the producing thread has to wait, and to be awakened, the consumer thread, once it has removed an element from the buffer, has to call notify or notify all on the same lock object. This will have the effect of awaking a producing thread that can carry on. And the same goes on the other side. If the buffer is empty, the consumer thread cannot, of course, consume any element, so it has to wait, and to be awakened, it has to be notified by a producing thread. One major caveat of this pattern is that when a thread is in this wait state, once it has called this wait method, it is blocked and there is no way we can interrupt it. So, if no thread is ever calling notify or notify all, there is no chance that this thread will be awakened. The only way to interrupt it will be to reboot the application to reboot the Java machine itself. Let us address this problem and others by using this lock pattern. Here is the producer. 
We just translated the synchronized block with this new lock pattern, and we have the same organization of the code for the consumer. Now, inside this guarded block of code, we still have the same structure. While the buffer is full, we have to put this thread in a wait state. And on the consuming side, when an element is consumed from the buffer, the consumer has to notify the producer that there is room in the buffer. How can this be done? Well, it is done with a new object of type condition and created from this lock object by calling the new condition method. The first condition here is called not full. We are going to call not full dot await on the producing side and not full dot signal on the consuming side. This await method is the equivalent of the wait method from the wait notify pattern and this signal method is the equivalent of the notify method. To do it in the other way, we can create a second condition object, this time called not empty. We are going to call not empty await if the buffer is empty and if a consumer wants to consume an object, and not empty dot signal once a producer has added an object to the buffer. So here is the full pattern we have at the end of the day. It looks like the wait notify pattern, but does not use synchronize. This condition object is the new object we introduce here. It is used to park and to awake threads in this pattern. It is built from the lock object, and the lock object can have any number of condition objects linked to it. Now, we need to be a little careful because this condition object, as all the Java objects, extends the object class, so it has a wait and a notify method. Those methods should not be taken for await and signal. In fact, if we try to use them, they will not work since we are not in a synchronized block of code. What does this pattern bring to us? In fact, it brings many things. The await call is blocking, but, and this is a difference with the wait call from the object class, it can be interrupted. We can interrupt the thread that is blocked on this await call. It was not the case on the wait method from the object class. In fact, there are five versions of this await method. The plain await method that we used, three await methods that takes timeout, that can be expressed in time units, for instance, two seconds, or in nanoseconds, and an await until that takes a date as a parameter, a date of course, sometimes in the future. And if we do not want this await call to be interrupted, we can also call await uninterruptibly, that will prevent the interruption of a thread to interrupt this method call. So this API gives us ways to prevent the blocking of waiting threads with the condition API. A last note, we saw that it was possible to create fair locks, and a fair locks will generate fair conditions. That is, if several threads are calling this await method one at a time, they will be awakened in the same order. Now wrap up this part unlock and condition. Lock and condition is another implementation of the wait notify pattern. It gives wiggle room to build better concurrent systems by providing a way to control interruptibility, to control timeouts in concurrent locking and lock acquisition, and to give fairness to our systems. Let's now talk about read-write locks. In some cases, not to say in most of the cases, what we need is exclusive writes. That is, what I want to do is to guard the block of code that is going to modify a variable or a collection, for instance, or a map. But I want to allow for parallel reads of this variable or of this collection or map. And this is not how regular locks work. That is, if I guard the block of code that is going to modify this variable and the block of code that is going to read it, I will have exclusive writes and also exclusive reads. This is what the read-write lock does, and this is what we are going to see now. A read-write lock is an interface with only two methods. First method is read-lock, to get a read-lock. And the second method, very simple, is write-lock, to get a write-lock. Both this read-lock and this write-lock are instances of lock, the lock interface that we just saw. Now the rules are the following. Only one thread can hold the write lock. When the write lock is held, no one can hold the read lock. And of course, as many threads as needed can hold the read lock. It means that if I guard a block of code with the write lock, the execution of this block of code will be exclusive. And if I guard another block of code with the read lock, this block of code will be available for as many threads as I need. Let us see that on an example. Read write lock is an interface and reentrant read write lock 
is the implementing class provided by the JDK. From this read write lock object, I create two locks, read lock and write lock with the read lock and write lock method. And since I got those two locks from the same read write lock, they form a pair of read and write locks. This point is very important. Those two locks can be used to create a thread safe cache. A cache can be implemented using a basic hash map. Here we have a map of long and user, which could be a cache to a database, long being the primary key of the user. Reading this cache is guarded by the read lock, by the same pattern as the pattern we saw using a basic lock object. Knowing the semantic of this read lock object, we know that any number of thread can read this cache at the same time. Now, this is the modification of the map, guarded by the write lock, once again with the same pattern. But this time, this write locking protects the modification of the cache and will prevent concurrent read that could read corrupted value. It could also be achieved using a concurrent hash map. We will see that in the fifth and last module of this course. A quick wrap up on this read write lock notion. It works on a single read write lock object that is used to get a write lock and a read lock. It is very important to understand that this pair of read and write locks must be created from the same read write lock object. The write operations are exclusive of other writes and reads. So when a thread is modifying, for instance, the cache object that we just created, no other threads can modify it and no other thread can read from it. But the read operations are free. They can be made in parallel. So it allows for extremely good throughput, especially if we have many reads and few writes, which is usually the assumption made when we create caches. See now the last part of this module about semaphores. Semaphores is a well-known concept in concurrent programming. It does not come from Java. It comes from the very early days of the Unix operating system. It looks like a lock, and in fact, it is some kind of a lock, but instead of allowing only one thread in the guarded block of code, it allows for more than one. And in fact, a semaphore is built and a number of permits. And this number of permits is the number of threads allowed in this block of code. Let us see that on an example. We have a semaphore class. When we create a semaphore in Java, we have to fix the number of permits on which this semaphore is built. And then there is an acquire method and a release method to acquire a permit and being allowed in the guarded block of code and to release this permit. A semaphore built in the normal way, in the default way, is non-fair. It means that if there are threads waiting for permits, they will be accepted randomly in the guarded block of code. This acquire method, of course, is blocking until a permit is made available. So, in our example, only five threads will be allowed to execute the guarded block of code at the same time. A semaphore can be made fair if I pass the true boolean at the second parameter of the construction of this object. It will create a fair semaphore. And I can also ask for more than one permit at a time. Acquire two here will ask for two permits. And if there is only one available, the thread executing this code will have to wait for a second one to be released. Of course, if we ask for two permits, we should also release two permits. This API has been built on the same ideas as the lock API, so I can also handle interruptibility and timeouts on the semaphore API. If I call the interrupt method on a thread that is blocked on an acquire call, this thread will throw an interrupted exception at once. If I do not want this behavior, then I can call the acquire uninterruptibly method on the semaphore object. And in this case, this thread cannot be interrupted. The only way to free him is by calling its release method. Now, if I interrupt this thread, it will not do anything at the moment of this method call. But if a permit becomes available, this thread will not be allowed in the guarded block of code. It will instead throw this interrupted exception. Once again, following the same ideas as the lock interface, acquisition can be made immediate. Try acquire will see if a permit is available, and if it is not the case, it will fail, return false, and I will be able to execute some other code than the guarded block of code. I can also pass a timeout to this try acquire method call so that this method will return false after this timeout. So the pattern, how to use a semaphore object, but it is not all. We also have specific methods on this semaphore object that do not exist on a classical lock object. Those methods make a semaphore more than just a lock with more than one permit. 
In fact, we have methods to handle both the permits and the waiting thread. First, we can reduce the number of permits after the semaphore has been created. It is not possible to increase this number of permits. We also have method to check if there are waiting threads on this semaphore. Are there any waiting thread? How many threads are waiting? And we can also get the collection of the waiting thread, which is not possible on the lock object. So we can now quickly wrap up this part on the semaphore object. The semaphore is built on the number of permits. Those permits can be acquired in different ways and must be released by the threads. This part of the API is basically the same as the lock API, the only difference being that a lock has only one permit and a semaphore has more than one. But beside that, it is also possible to query a semaphore for the number of waiting threads. Are there any waiting threads? How many? And we can also get references on those threads. Okay. Time to see some code in action. What are we going to see in this live coding session? Well, we are going to see this producer-consumer pattern using the lock interface and this condition object. We will also see how a read-write lock can be set to create a concurrent cache as we saw in the slide. Let us see this producer-consumer pattern in action using the lock interface. So we have a shared buffer that is just a list of integers. And then this lock object of type lock, the interface provided by the JDK, and implemented by reentrant lock, which is the standard implementation of this lock interface, also available in the JDK. Then we have this consumer class implementation of the callable of string interface. It has a single method call that returns a string of character, and it is going to try to consume 50 elements from that buffer by just removing elements from the end of this buffer. And this block of code here is guarded by this lock object here, lock.lock .lock and lock.unlock. And once all of the items have been consumed, we just return the message that we consumed the right number of items. Now, we need to add some code here in order to guarantee that this lock.unlock method call will be called whatever happens between the locking of this object and the last instruction of this block. Suppose, for instance, this method or this method throws an exception or something wrong happens here. If this lock.unlock is not called, then this lock will not be released and we will have a deadlock in our application. To ensure that, there is one very simple way is to put this block of code in a try block here and to add a finally close like this and put our unlock call in it. Thus, if something wrong happens in this block of code, before leaving the method, we have the guarantee at the language level that this unlock method will be called. Let us now take a look at the producer. The producer is basically the same. It also has a lock and unlock call here. We'll wait while the buffer is full, and once there is room in it, we'll add an element to the buffer. Once again, here we need to make sure that this unlock is called. So let us add a finally close, like that, for our code to be correct. Now we need to add some code here in the case the buffer is empty and we cannot consume any element from it. The code we need to add here works with a condition object built on this lock object. Let us create this condition object. Condition. We are going to call this condition is empty. And it is simply built by calling the new condition method on this lock object. Let us take this empty object and call empty.await here. It will have the effect of parking this thread and releasing the lock from this lock object. And to unpark this thread, we need to signal it from the producer once the producer has added an element to the buffer. So here, is empty will be signaled to unpark the consumer thread. And we need to do the same kind of thing on the producer part. Once the producer has produced, if the buffer is full, the producer cannot produce any element here. So we need to park the producing thread here with another condition. Let us create this other condition that will be called is full, created in the exact same way. New condition. This is full condition will be used to park the producing thread if the buffer is full. And once a consumer has consumed an element, here we will signal the producing thread that it can continue to run. So we have our consumer and producer class working. 
let us take a look at the rest of the code. First, we create a list of four producers and a list of four consumers. Then we are going to add them all to a producers and consumer list of callable. Create an executor service with the right number of threads. We have four producers and four consumers, so we are going to add eight threads to this executor service and invoke all those callables in the executor service with this invoke all method from the executor service that takes a collection of callables as a parameter. It will return a list of futures, and for each of those futures, we are going to execute this code here. Basically, we are just going to print out the message written by the producer and the consumer. This get method may throw an interrupted exception or execution exception, so we just print out the message if this is the case. And once again, since we are using an executor service here, we shut it down in a finally close of a try block. So let us run this code. We can see that our four producers have been producing 50 elements each that have been consumed by all the consumers and the executor service has been properly shut down. Let us see now what happens if the executor service is not set to the right number of threads. Suppose we put only four threads in it. Let us run this code. And what we can see is that nothing happens. Obviously, our system is blocked. It is still running because here we can see that the Java virtual machine is still running, but it seems to be blocked. Let us stop it and let us run it again, but this time in debug mode. We cannot switch to the debug perspective. Here we have all the threads of our application, the main thread, which is handling everything, and the four threads of our executor service. Let us pause one and see where it is. We can see that it is blocked on the line 58 of our code, which is this await method. What is happening? In fact, this await call releases the lock of this object, but does not release the producing thread. It means that this thread is blocked, is still executing our task, and cannot take another task, for instance, the consumer. Since we have only four threads, what happens is that those four threads are running our four producers, and there is no thread available to run our consumers. So basically, our producers have filled the buffer, waiting for some room to be made by a consumer, but no consumer has any chance to be executed since there is no thread available. So when you design this kind of system, just be aware that this is the total number of threads available, and if you are in a consumer-producer pattern, you need to make sure that you have enough threads to run all your consumers and your producers. The only solution here is to kill the JVM by clicking this red button here. Let us now suppose that there is a problem in our producer, and for some reason it is not going to produce any data. Let us simulate an exception here, for instance, a division by zero exception, and let us run this code. What we can see is that, once again, our system seems to be locked, the JVM is still running, but nothing is happening. In fact, we can analyze this problem quite easily. The exception is thrown here. Since we are in a try-finally block, this code will be executed, so this producer will release the thread it is in, and once this is done, no production of any element will ever occur. So what happens on the consuming side? Well, our four consumers will be calling this await method, but since no producer will ever call the signal all method, the consuming threads will never be unpacked from this await call, and the system is just locked down. So how can we work around this fact? Well, as we saw in the slides, it is possible to add a timeout to this await method. This version of the await method returns void, meaning that it does not return anything in fact, of course. If we add a timeout to it, suppose 10 milliseconds, Right. What does it mean? It means that if after 10 milliseconds nothing happened, it's probably that there is something wrong on the producing side. So of course, this timeout has to be tuned for your application and for your needs. Here, 10 milliseconds is enough. And this time, this await method returns a boolean. So after 10 milliseconds, this await call will return. It will not block forever. And it will return with a false value. So what we can do is the following. Wrap this in an if Call. and if we get the false value for this call, then we can throw, for instance, the new 
timeout exception with the message consumer timeout. Okay, and add this timeout exception here to the call method of our callable. Now, our producer will still fail to produce any elements in the buffer, but after 10 milliseconds, our consumer will stop waiting for nothing, basically, and throw this exception. So let us see what it gives on the executing side. We can see that our four producers are throwing this arithmetic exception division by zero, and our four consumers are stopping their execution with this timeout exception here. And of course, no data has been produced and no data has been consumed. So this await method that takes a timeout is a very good way to handle errors in a producer-consumer pattern and in other patterns. It can be used and should be used to avoid deadlock condition. This was not possible with the wait and notify pattern to implement the producer-consumer. Let us see how we can use read-write lock to create thread-safe and efficient caches. We all know that the hashmap class from the JDK is not thread-safe. We can see that on an example. Let us create a very simple, very basic cache, which could be any primary key, and string, which could be any value. We have two very simple methods on this cache, a put method and a get method. Now let us create a producer that will add forever random key value pairs in this cache. Here our key value pairs are just numbers and the string value. And just after adding a key value pair, we are going to check if this key is indeed in the cache. There is no remove method in this class, so we do not expect a put to fail. But since we are launching four producers in an executor service of size 4, we will have concurrency and things can go wrong. Let us see that by running this code. Indeed, if we run this code, we can see that several keys have not been added to the map due to race conditions in the hashmap class itself. Now, the first solution that might come to mind, and we did not talk about that in the slides for a very good reason, would be to use the collections factory class from the JDK, and in that class, the synchronized map method that returns indeed a map that is synchronized. Let us quickly check the implementation of this map. It is an instance of this private static member class called synchronized map. And if we check its method, we can see that in fact, they are all synchronized wrappers on the method from HashMap. So indeed, this solution would work from a pure functional point of view, but it would be extremely inefficient, allowing for minimal throughput on our cache. So we do not want to use this solution. We want to use, of course, a better one. Let's go back to our cache class and create this read-write lock that we talked about in a slide. The implementation provided by the JDK is called reentrant read-write lock, this one. And from this read-write lock, we can create the first lock that we're going to call read lock, equals lock dot read lock, and a second lock that we're going to call write lock by calling the write lock method. Let us import the lock interface. And with those two locks that are bound together by this read write lock object, we can create a very efficient cache. This is the put method. So here we want to lock this code using the write lock. So of course, we are going to put this in a try closer because we want to make sure that the write lock dot unlock will be called when we return. And this block of code will ensure that. And we're going to do the same with the read operation on this cache called the read lock method dot lock. Put this in a try close. And finally, execute the read lock unlock method. The way this read write lock pair works is the following. All the read operations are free and can be made in parallel. So if we have many reads, they will not be blocked. It was not the case on the synchronized version or the collections that synchronized map. The write operations are exclusive. Only one thread can modify the map at the same time. And when a thread is modifying the map, no one can read it. So let us run our code once again with this message to see that we are going add values to the map. And this time we can see that no value has been lost. Why? Because all the threads will add the values one by one and one at a time. No more race condition will occur on the internal structure of this hash map. So let us quickly wrap up this live coding session. 
what did we see in the code? First of all, we saw how to properly lock the producer-consumer pattern with instances of this lock interface, which is a reentrant lock. We then saw how it was possible to deal with exceptions properly and timeouts within this pattern, which was not possible with the object.wait and notify pattern. And in a second example, we saw the hash map in action in a concurrent environment and how easy it is to make it fail in such an environment. The hash map implementation is not thread safe, so do not use it in a concurrent application without precautions. So we also saw how to properly synchronize it, and for that we used a pair of read-write blocks. We did that to ensure a better throughput, especially with parallel read operations on this map allowed, than the fully synchronized version of the hash map you can build using the collections.synchronizedMap method. Last note on this point, we will also see thread-safe implementations of maps, concurrent skip list maps, and concurrent hash maps in the last module of this. To wrap up this second module, what did we learn in this second module? Well, we saw the differences between intrinsic and explicit locking, that is, locking using APIs. I would say that the most important difference is that explicit locking gives wiggle room to create efficient concurrent applications. From a pure technical point of view, we saw locks and conditions, read-write locks, we saw semaphores, but most important, we saw that those structures allow for interruptibility, timeouts, and fairness. And this is what we call wiggle room here. Thank you for watching, I hope you found this module interesting. The next module is also extremely interesting, about latches and barriers, and we are going to see how to compute things in parallel, leveraging those APIs.